Okay, so we now solve uh, an example on boundary layers. So now you have uh, an aircraft cruising at 900 kilometers per hour, constant altitude, um, zero angle of attack, so it's um, uh, traveling at a horizontal level at zero angle of attack, such that the fuselage um, and the travel direction are aligned. So you have, um, so now the question is, if that's the case, we want to know how much uh, viscous drag, uh, so the wall shear stress friction, um, is generated um, over the fuselage. So assume it has a diameter of uh, six meters and the length of the fuselage is um, from one end to the other is 60 meters. At the altitude it's flying, the density is um, 0 0.41 and the kinematic viscosity is 10 to the minus 5 for air. Let's just take it as that. So we want to get the viscous friction drag and the, the drag force um, is just the half row u infinity squared times some area associated with the drag coefficient. And if you go back to, um, to, a pre to the previous lecture, what we said is let's take this cylinder, which represents the fuselage, and let's take a pair of scissors and cut along this line. So you have more like your toilet paper roll and you uh, cut along it so and then you uh, open it up so you get a flat plate. Um, and the air is just in touch. It's wetting the fuselage only from one side. So the, um, the contact area between the air and um, the fuselage both going parallel to each other so um, is just the pi dl so pi d uh, is the circumference of um, this fuselage and l is the length of uh, of it so that's a rectangular area once you have cut that cylinder open and um, then once you have done that you're just going to get the picture of just a, um, where is that? Uh, you're just going to get a picture of a flat plate with flow going parallel to it. So the cylinder that we had here, as we said, um, we just cut it with along this cut here line. And you open it up and you end up with um, so that's the pi d is this length and the l is this length and the u infinity is going parallel to the plate. So that's our, so now we've turned this complex problem into a flat plate, um, into a flat plate problem and you go to the flat plate boundary layer problem, a zero pressure gradient boundary layer, um, you get uh, the drag force to be half rho u infinity square times a times cd and we and cd is the drag coefficient so let's talk about that for a second and we know from from the previous lecture that the drag coefficient is a function of the Reynolds number uh, and the Reynolds number tells us whether our flow is um, turbulent or laminar um, so this is what we had in the previous lecture for the drag coefficient and the drag coefficient yeah uh, so we need to compute the Reynolds number, which is what we have here. Uh, we take the density of the air. Um, it's given us to here as viscosity over density, just like it's over there. It's 10 to the minus 5, so you plug that. For U infinity, it's 900 kilometers per hour, but then you divide by 3.6 to get it into meters per second, so that's 250. And that's the length um, uh, in the x direction. So you need to consult your coordinate system that we have described in the previous lecture. So that's x and that's l. This is x equal 0. This is x equal l. Um, that's x equal to l. So now if we want to get um, the overall drag due to the wall shear stress on this flat plate, 
we just get use this relationship. We found the Reynolds number to be one and a half billion. Uh, so that's much, much larger than the one million uh, sort of uh, line in the sand, um, uh, which separates the turbulent from a laminar boundary layer. So we can easily um, be comfortable with the um, boundary layer being turbulent. So we'll use the one seventh um, dependence low and so you so it's zero so you plug in Reynolds number into the zero zero three one or e to the minus one seven so you get triple zero one five that's your drag coefficient and what units does it have right it's unitless so it doesn't have any units um, and let's look at this number uh, zero point zero zero one five um that's for that's a very streamlined um object and if we when we move further on and we look at a cylinder uh that's in the free stream you can comp you can uh you will know at that point that the drag coefficient for a cylinder is around a thousand times larger than this it goes up to 1.2 between 0.4 to 1.2 uh, so it's it can be as much as a thousand times uh, the drag coefficient for a flat plate so this is a very small number <clears throat> but still uh, we now uh, compute the drag coefficient we plug into this equation the density uh, the velocity of 250 meters per second uh, the surface area and the drag coefficient so we get 21.7 kilonewtons and let's put that in perspective that's just the the rubbing action of the air as it goes past it um, it creates that's the no slip condition it creates a wall shear stress and that wall and that wall shear stress is variable from one end uh, of the plane to the other end so is the wall shear stress higher at the front at the leading edge of the airplane or the trailing edge of course at the leading edge because the boundary layer is so thin and the wall shear stress scales with uh, one over the thickness so it's a very small thickness here it's a very large wall shear stress and as you move further on the wall shear stress becomes smaller and smaller but the sum of all that the integration of all that um, gives us an average wall shear stress which is um, described by this drag force so if you take the um, drag force over uh, BL here, the uh, pi DL, um, which we had over here. So um, you take the drag force over the A, that gives you a wall shear stress. So the the average wall shear stress is half for your infinity square CD. Anyways, we have 21.7 kilonewton. So let's put that in perspective. What and that's if you divide by 9.8, which is g, 9.8 meter per second square, the 21 22 kilonewton is around 2,200 kilograms, which is the weight of an SUV. Uh, so you want to imagine uh, that. So that's an SUV that weighs around 2.2 tons. So you want to imagine that you have a pulley, uh, the airplane is hooked up to a rope that's hooked up to a that's just uh, frictionlessly rolling on a pulley and it's trying to pull up this weight of the car only due to friction. We still haven't talked about other forms of drag. Um, so the question is now, I think I've answered it, this, was this 21.8 kilonewton, was it friction drag or was it due to pressure? Of course, we just talked about it being just due to the wall shear stress. So that is the friction drag. Uh, the drag, as we said, when you go to back to this slide in the previous lecture, has two, comp um, has two components. It has a shear stress component and a pressure component. So that's what we're going to, um, to do next to just uh, reinforce this information that we have here. Okay. So now let's do, um, to just reinforce this um, friction drag concept versus uh, shear stress drag, 
when you sum them up, it is the total drag on an object. For the example we solved here, we only did the viscous friction drag. So we only did the friction drag. Uh, that's right here. So the 21.74 kilonewton was only the friction drag. They didn't give us any information about pressure variation over the airplane, so um, we couldn't compute it. And this friction drag was only due to the fuselage, just the cylindrical part. Uh, we didn't include the effect of the wings, the engines, um, and the um, elevators and the rudder. Um, and even though they look smaller in size compared to the fuselage, but remember it has, uh, they have two sides. The wetted area is on top and on bottom. Same thing here. You have uh, the side facing you where it says triple seven and the side um, facing uh, into the page. Um, and it's, so you get some maybe in reality, the viscous friction drag is could be maybe as much as double this. Um, it's because there is much more area on the wings. You have two wings and the engines too. Um, uh, so that's just to give us a um, sort of an order of magnitude estimation of what's going on. So that was, as we said, was the friction drag. So now let's take this solved example. We're not going to solve it, but um, we're just going to go over it really quickly for you to, um, when you do it on your own your, and you study it, um, you get the, the, uh, the main conclusion of it. So you have a delta wing, so you see it's triangular. Uh, it's a five degree delta wing half angle. Uh, the cord length from the leading edge to the trailing edge is two meters, as it says here. And it's flying or it's being subjected to a flow at Mach number of 0.2, so that's twice the speed of sound. They tell you that you have the density to be 1.23 kilogram and um, the working pressure is 1.01 um, 10 to the 5 Pascal, which is over here. And what they tell you is that you, you have a uniform pressure on the because this um, delta wing is at a zero angle of attack, so the uh, travel direction is 100% parallel to the cord length between the leading edge and the trailing edge. So you have zero angle of attack, which um, will result in the pressure uh, at the top side of the wing and the bottom side of the wing to be equal uh, in magnitude, and that is uh, 1.31 kilonewton, um, 10 to the 5 Pascal. So the pressure distribution is uniform over the top side and the bottom side, it's 10 to the 5. And on the back face, the pressure is just P infinity, which is uh, 1, 10 to the 5 uh, Pascal. They also tell us, um, so that's what we have over here. We have a uniform pressure at the bottom, at the top, and a uh, back pressure of P infinity. And they tell us that we have a shear stress. So there is a wall shear stress. Um, and just like in a subsonic mag um, turbulent boundary layer that we have seen before, um, the shear stress will be highest at the leading edge and will be lowest at the trailing edge. So they tell us that the shear stress distribution looks like this. So at the leading edge, uh, that's your wedge over here. Um, uh, your shear stress just sort of exponentially drops actually to the exponent uh, 0 0.2. And S is the, is the distance along the tau. Um, is the, um, so that's your S over here. It's parallel to... Um, the surface of the, of the wing. And um, I think, uh, right, so there was one thing I wanted to mention here, uh, which was, um, right, it'll, it'll, it will come back to us, but anyways, you have uh, that's the S direction and that's the, the X direction. Right, so the m more important point that I 
uh, was stuck on a moment ago was is that the pressure acts perpendicular to the S direction and the wall shear stress acts parallel to it so the wall shear stress that's by definition wall shear stress acts parallel to the area and the pressure acts perpendicular and these are two pieces of information that you really need to keep um, um, on the top of your head every time you solve a problem because that's uh, going to um, uh, move remove a lot of the confusion on how to uh, proceed with um, with um, with solving so the pressure force is actually normal to the surface and that's different than the lift force and drag force which we have talked about before so here they ask us to uh, calculate the drag coefficient so what we have here is we have the pressure um, creating um, so let's see it has a so this distributed pressure we can uh, sum it up integrate it into um, an F at the bottom right uh, due to pressure and it acts at 90 degree to the surface and same thing at the top so it also acts perpendicular to the surface it's the same magnitude of the force F because the pressure is the same and then you have um, this F over here and now if we're talking about lift and drag so now this is a normal force that, and that's another normal force so if I want the um, the drag I want the component of this force in the X which is the travel direction so X is parallel to my U infinity that's U infinity here which is my travel direction and a perpendicular one which is which counteracts the um, or it's in along the gravitational um, vector so you, again you want to differentiate between a normal force which is the F and uh, the F um, has two you can project it into a drag component and a lift generating uh, component so same thing here you have a lift generating component and you have a drag generating component of that um, of that if you project it into um, two components right and the wall shear stress same same idea it has a lift gener it has a drag generating component along the X and a lift generating component along the Y um, so that's that's the idea that we want uh, to do so once you sum up uh, if we were now we're looking on only at the drag for this particular problem so I get the wall shear stress multiplied by the uh, this is five degrees so times cosine five and then you integrate over the whole area you get a wall shear stress drag component and here you have um, so when you project the P upper minus P lower uh, onto you're, you're going to get just uh, because they're equal here it makes life easier uh, so you're going to get um, P minus P infinity multiplied by uh, this area so that's your projection in the X direction uh, and that gives you the pressure drag this gives you the shear stress drag just like we or the friction drag just like we uh, did in the commercial aircraft fuselage uh, moments ago and this picture gives you the pressure drag and then you sum them up to get the whole drag so if you now the this is a solved problem in the book um, so um, I just want to emphasize that uh, you look at the magnitude of the skin friction drag um, as we as we've seen before here it's around 1.8 kilonewton um, so um, right uh, 1.8 kilonewton is the skin friction drag that's due to shear stress while your pressure drag is more like 10 kilonewtons uh, so the the difference between them is one order of magnitude pretty much uh, that's more like five or six times the pressure drag is five or six times larger than 
than the skin friction drag and it's it's almost the case like so the pressure drag is is often uh, or most of the time is significantly larger than the skin friction drag uh, so I think that's one point I wanted to make and also to emphasize the normal force as opposed to um, the lift and drag uh, lift and drag forces normal forces and power and and um, uh, shear shear um, forces as opposed to lift and drag uh, forces and then your drag force you can uh, just divide by half rho u infinity square uh, and you get the drag coefficient so this is significantly larger than, uh, than what we had before because before we had uh, 0.0015 so that's um, in one thousandth the one before and here it's 20,000 so it's as we said is around 10 times larger uh, so it's an so the pressure drag plays an important role and it's only a small yeah I mean you can see it's an only a small pressure uh, increase 1.3 uh, 10 to the 5 compared to 1 uh, 10 to the 5 um, so you're getting around 0 0.3 atmosphere that's actually not too not too small <clears throat> for aerodynamics but this is um, for uh, subsonic aer aerodynamics that's actually slightly on the larger side but um, for supersonic aerodynamics that's typical and um, that's fine so um, yeah now uh, as we are going through our revision um, uh, and we started with the picture of an airplane let's just look at the at the jet engine and what it does we talked about that it generates the uh, thrust force to counteract our drag and how does it work it um, what a jet engine does um, it takes air at velocity v1 it accelerates it and throws it uh, at velocity v2 um, and what it does inside the engine is uh, the thermodynamic cycle which we have it idealized here it's um, and if you look at what what happens is you uh, you start with intaking your air at point one on a PV diagram so you start with at atmospheric pressure which is B uh, you compress your um, the incoming air uh, here they show it isentropically definitely you're going to have inefficiencies you compress it both in the diffuser part as well so you decelerate it a little a bit as well as in the compressor part which we're going to come to a moment later and then you add heat so at constant pressure again this is ideal so you supply energy and you see what happens on a, a ts diagram temperature um, entropy diagram so you're isentrop isentropically uh, compressing one to two um, there's an that's an ideal case typically you're going to have deficiencies and you're going to get less pressure than what you um, are supposed to get and uh, after you compress you add heat and this is your constant temp your constant pressure heat addition process uh, and then uh, you expand in the turbine at, at um, in the turbine as well as the nozzle at the end because it's an important part of the process at uh, constant entropy or in an isentropic that is frictionless um, and um, uh, frictionless process so uh, that's your three to four and you um, you cool you cool off right and then um that's your three to four and then you throw out to um you throw out your hot gases to the atmosphere at constant pressure all right so that's what um what a turbine does but if you look at a turbine oh uh, sorry a right a jet engine if we look at the components of the compressor and the turbine parts of it um these engines on an airplane typically have a hundred percent back work ratio back work ratio so they're sitting on the same shaft and all the energy that is produced by the turbine uh, goes back to supply uh, to provide energy for the compressor almost hundred percent maybe 98 95 percent 
Um, and the task, primarily the task of this engine is to provide the thrust force. And the thrust force is generated actually by two things. Well, we said um, what this engine does, it accelerates the air from velocity v1 v2 to velocity v2, which is correct. But really the one thing that uh, people generally miss is that it, it generates a lot of mass flow rate, as we will see in the next example. So an important function of the jet engine is to, is to suck in as much mass flow rate as possible and accelerate it. So not just to accelerate it, but also to create a large mass flow rate because it's the multiplication of those two, uh, the acceleration part of the velocity, the difference in velocity, and the mass flow rate is what gives you the, your thrust force that pushes your uh, engine forward, that's your thrust force, against the action of the uh, drag force, which tries to, um, which is primarily pressure and friction drag, that's your drag force. Very well. And um, you can compute the, the, the power that goes to overcome drag, uh, if you, which is just the thrust times the velocity. That's the work going into, uh, into friction, um, into overcoming the uh, total drag force, which is, fr which is friction drag and pressure drag. Um, so you need for this you need a lot of a lot of fuel as we will see in a, um, in the next example and you can I mean it's natural that you your takeoff weight is around 50% in fuel um, so if your airplane weighs 200 tons it's easy for you to and you're going on a long haul trip it's easy for you to carry 100 tons of fuel um, so. There, you need space in the airplane to store all that fuel in a safe uh, fashion. Um, so here's a, here's a, a cartoon of what go, what's going on. Uh, so you start with, um, let's do a thermodynamic type analysis. You start with kinetic, so the air comes in at um, a velocity, so it, that mass flow rate of air has a kinetic energy, but also has a temperature, which means it has enthalpy. So the air comes in, it gets through the process and of being compressed and then gets a boost by heat addition uh, through adding fuel and burning it up. And then um, that air, that hot compressed air runs the turbine and then leaves the um, exhaust nozzle to the atmosphere um, and it leaves with a very high kinetic energy but also it leaves at a hot temperature so that's really the basic function thermodynamic function of of um, of an of an engine a gas turbine uh, engine and um, that's this are um, this is your thermodynamic uh, revision and what we mean by as we said the backward ratio both the compressor and the turbine are connected to the same shaft and all the energy from the turbine goes to run the compressor. Um, okay, let's do this example. You have this jet engine, it produces 210 uh, kilonewtons of thrust. Um, the airplane is going at 800 kilometers per hour ground speed in headwind of 100 kilometers per hour. Uh, they tell you that the incoming atmospheric air temperature is 220 Kelvin. So that's around minus 70 degrees C. So, or what is it? 273 minus 220. So that's around minus 50 degrees C. And the hot gases leave at 620. So you come in at minus 50 degrees C and you leave at, let's see, maybe 350 degrees C. Um, and they give you some air properties. And the question is, what is the mass flow rate that is going through the, um, the engine? What is M dot? That's the question. Uh, if you're given these bulk quantities, um, the engine thrust, the oops, the engine thrust and the temperatures, 
uh, coming in and leaving. And also they tell you um, that the hot gases leave the engine at 950 meters per second. So this 950 meters per second is the velocity of the air, so it needs clarification. It's the speed of the air relative to someone uh, sitting on the engine. So just to, um, to clarify, that should be added in here, but um, now you know it. And then they tell you if this engine is going on a five hour trip um, and it uses a fuel of calorific value of so and so, how much of that fuel do you need to carry on to go on this five hour trip given all these parameters? Um, right, so let's see. Um, one is we want to define our velocities, so we leave at 950 meters per second. And as I just clarified, it's relative to someone sitting on the engine. So that's um, uh, the aerodynamic speed we are interested in. But what's coming in uh, is because we're giving ground speed and we're giving uh, headwind. So you sum those up, you get uh, 900 kilometers per hour. The incoming, uh, so someone sitting on the engine will see the air incoming at 900 kilometers, which means 250 meters per second. So you're um, the incoming air comes at 250 and uh, meters per second and minus 50 degrees C leaves at 950 meters per second and um, 350, um, uh, 350 degrees C. So that's the picture that we have. We have our sort of our kinetic energy uh, and enthalpy that comes in because temperature is enthalpy. And we have our enthalpy and kinetic energy that, that leave. Um, and we also know that we have also are given the thrust. The thrust is related to the mass flow rate and the velocities incoming and leaving. Okay, so we start with the thrust. We have 210 kilo newtons. Uh, you have your m dot, uh, which we're after. And your velocities that uh, are leaving and incoming are 950 and 250. So we get a mass flow rate of 300 kilo kilograms per um, per second. So if you want to stop for one, for just a moment here and try to contemplate what this 300 kilograms um, per second, you multiply that by um, 3600 um, and you get how many kilograms per hour but if you want to do it uh, for, for one minute so multiply 300 kilograms per second times 60 so that gives you 18,000 kilograms per minute so this engine is eating so if we if we go back to that SUV we were looking at it weighs uh, two tons and this engine is eating 18, eating in terms of air, 18 tons. You, you want to imagine that this engine is eating 18 cars of that size in, in their weight of air. So that's a huge amount. It's a terribly huge amount. It's, um, it's, hard, to, um, it's hard to imagine, but um, now you get some sense of what it is. 18, uh, let's see, um, maybe 10 of those cars, right? Um, it's eating 10 of those cars, 9, 10 of those cars a minute um, as, it, as it guzzles through. Um, so that's a huge, huge number, 300 kilograms per second. So that comes to say that our thrust force not only comes from the difference in velocity, but really the most part of the thrust force comes from this huge, um, this huge mass flow rate. And then let's do the first law of thermodynamic. Um, so here I have my m dot my um, the air comes in with a certain enthalpy and a certain kinetic energy uh, through the inlet of the through the engine inlet. Then plus, then you add heat to it. So that's why you sum. So your that's the air comes in with a certain level of um, kinetic energy and enthalpy. You add heat, and then it just leaves the engine. So these are, I'm looking at all the external energy sources uh, outside this red control volume. So uh, I leave at a new level of 
enthalpy and kinetic energies. This is my first law of thermodynamics analysis. And now I can plug in um, a number. So uh, if I'm at a, st I'm at a steady state, um, then my mass flow rate in will leave. So I'm just have one mass flow rate, it's the M dot. And the enthalpy difference will is related to the temperature through this uh, the the specific heat uh, cp and so we plug those back into the equation so here is your um, if i'm after this qn how much heat i'm um um putting into the engine because if i want to know how much fuel i need um i need to carry with me i need to know how much fuel i'm burning per minute or per hour and I need to multiply by the number of hours, then I will know how much fuel I need to carry. So it's what I burn in the engine, this Q dot N that I have here, uh, is what I'm trying to compute. Um, and that's my first law of thermodynamics. So here you rearrange that equation here, uh, and you're gonna get that over there. So you substitute for the mass flow rate, the enthalpies, the Cp delta T, which is here, and for the kinetic energy difference and uh, you're going to to get that um, the kinetic energy the the um, enthalpic energy difference and the kinetic energy difference are on the same order of magnitude um, so uh, and then you multiply by the mass flow rate. so i'm supplying heat at a rate of about 250 megawatts um, so if I divide, so that's 250 megajoules per second. So I need to know how many joules, megajoules I'm putting in five hours. I multiply with five hours. So five hours has 3600 seconds times five. And then uh, that's the total megajoules that I have uh, spent throughout the trip. And I see how much, how many kilograms by dividing by the megajoules per kilogram. So I need about a hundred tons of fuel for this um, for this trip to supply this engine. So these numbers are a little bit on the high side, uh, but it's just a, um, a to show to show you um, uh, how the calculations are done. Now let's put this um, get some some type of efficiency. Because the whole purpose of this engine is not to produce power for the aircraft. It's, mere, it's just to produce thrust for the aircraft to push you forward, uh, which is your 210 kilonewton. So let's get some sort of efficiency. So I can get a useful energy uh, power, that's the propulsive energy, uh, that goes into counteracting the drag. So I get the thrust. So it's force times linear velocity. Uh, and you get um, 52 megawatts. So if I need to get some type of efficiency, I put 250 megawatts of fuel burnt. You see, then you have inefficiencies in the, com in the combustion process, inefficiencies in each step along the way. Uh, and we only get end up getting 20% of that. So 50 megawatts of propulsive power uh, compared to 250, so 50 over 250, so that's only one fifth. So that's only 20% sort of, uh, if you want to do it that way, uh, sort of 20% efficiency from fuel um, to from fuel to propulsion. Um, so it's a it's a low number, and these engines are huge. They 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 take. Um, fossil fuel from the earth and they they just throw it up in the um, in the upper atmosphere so that's just to give you the scale of, uh, of things okay i think this would probably be the last example i'm going to do today uh, so here you have uh, a zeppelin it used to be um, people were excited about it um, at the beginning of um, the 20th century and um, um, they are huge machines they they're filled with a light gas um, the, the gas that they um, that this thing used to be filled up with is hydrogen 
and um, unfortunately um, at one show uh, where this thing can carry up to I think 100 to 100 200 400 people I think they were up in this thing uh, in this zeppelin uh, this balloon um, and just the hydrogen caught fire in a show so that killed the whole project so um, I think it's coming back these days I've read something recently about um, zeppelins flying again um, for uh, local you know transportation so um, so they're they're coming back again hopefully they're gonna use helium rather than hydrogen anyways um, so these uh, characteristic volume uh, for one of those is 15,000 meters cubed so um, if you put, if you want to put that in scale uh, that's 150 meters in length times 10 meters times 10 meters so this thing is just huge the amount of volume that um, um, that it takes its maximum diameter is 14 meters and it's flying at 30 meters per second at a standard altitude which gives you the density so the um, it has an angle of attack it has a because it has an angle of attack it it provides some lift at this velocity so the question is what should the total weight of this zeppelin be so let's see how we want to approach this thing uh, they tell you that this thing is moving at a constant speed and constant altitude which means it's it's cruising so it's in um, in static equilibrium in the z direction and in dynamic well it's probably both dynamic equilibrium in both directions it's not accelerating so it's cruising it's actually in dynamic equilibrium because just because it's moving in um, uh, so it has its weight and now so they tell us it has a weight and we should not we should uh, naturally imagine it has a weight and we want to know how much that weight is given the information that we have there so here is your zeppelin it's um, it has it's moving horizontally parallel to you infinity uh, so it sees the air coming at you infinity it has a small angle of attack of they said that gives you a, a lift coefficient of 0 0.05 and um, uh, that's your density at that altitude it's not that it's not that high um, one point um, the uh, 1000 meter it's the sort of um, the same or slightly less than the sea level um, sea level density 1.24 so but still very close so now if this is uh, cruising at a constant altitude that means I don't have acceleration it's not uh, rising and it's not um, losing altitude so constant altitude so there's no motion in the z direction so here is my z direction no motion in the z direction so no acceleration so my my system is dynamically equal so there is uh, an equilibrium in the z direction sigma fz all external forces will be equal to zero so let's see what these external forces are okay i'll give you the first one it's the weight um and the lift right so they tell you that it has a lift coefficient so that's your hint anything else I think we started talking about this at the beginning it's filled with a gas like helium and that's given so the the zeppelin is what should give you this so it's either helium or hydrogen h2 I think we talked about it being filled with hydrogen at the beginning and uh, it coating fire and um, all 400 passengers just perishing so that project got killed so because it's light it creates buoyancy so that's your other force pushing you upward so don't don't forget about that remember as you're sitting listening to to this uh, lecture and watching the, this video you are um, you are about a hundred grams lighter just because there is atmosphere around you 
so the atmosphere makes you lighter by 100 kilo by 100 grams so that's more like a snickers bar um, due to the buoyancy force you don't feel it it's it's a small force but um, yeah that's the point so we have lift and buoyancy pulling you up and weight is pulling you down so the lift is related to the angle of so it's related to the lift coefficient and the dynamic head and some some area so here they specify the area so every lift coefficient this this comes as a pair a and cl they they come as a pair so they every problem should tell you or you should know what it is so uh, this lift coefficient is based on the maximum cross-sectional area which is the d max over here uh pi d squared uh pi over 4 d squared and uh, your buoyancy is from the Archimedes principle. It's just the volume of the the volume of the the displaced volume multiplied by the density of the outside air multiplied by gravity. So that's your buoyancy force. So plug in uh, your um, and plug in for the numbers. So let's see. Um, so the weight is so this is your half. That's your density. That's the velocity you're moving at. That's your pi over four, uh, 14 square. That's the um, that's the area associated with this lift coefficient, CL 0 0.05. And um, here is your density of the air. So you take the um, multiplied by the displaced volume of the air multiplied by gravity. So that's your buoyancy force. So you'll see uh, the the lift component at this low velocity, so 30 meters per second, is not that low, it's around 100 kilometers per hour. It's, it's a good speed, but it's not the speed of a commercial aircraft. It produces around uh, three kilonewton of lift. Um, it's not huge. The most part of the lift of the, um, uh, of the force counteracting the weight is the buoyancy force. Um, so if you look at that, the the aerodynamic lift is only around I don't know uh, four over sixteen that is um, two and a half percent approximately um, so two and a half percent of the weight comes from the aerodynamic lift while uh, seven ninety seven and a half percent comes from the buoyancy from the huge volume that it has so this thing. Right, so this was this would be your weight that they're asking for, and if you divide by g, it's approximately 17 uh, tons. Um, so it's a lightweight uh, aircraft, but still able to carry 400 people. Unlike, uh, as we will see in the next slide, uh, or as we have seen in the previous slide, an aircraft can carry up to 100 tons in fuel. So that's how much fuel you need to burn. So, you get the idea. Uh, I would recommend that you go to the book, the Anderson, and look at the solved example 1.9. Uh, it's got to do with buoyancy, so please look at that. Um, but then, now, in our revision of aerodynamics, we want to move on uh, to a little bit more of aerodynamics and look at uh, a real aircraft. So, here we have uh, the... Boeing triple seven. We are looking at the Wikipedia uh, source page, so they have the specifications for um, uh, this aircraft. So you'll you'll notice that there are uh, different versions um, in different models that uh, for the Boeing triple seven, and um, they have seating length as we've seen before around 60 to 70 meters wingspan also same idea on the same order of magnitude of 60 meters um, so we'll we'll move on and look at the empty weight so it, when it's empty it's around 130 uh, 250 170 tons uh, in empty weight uh, and when it lands, so that's when it lands with cargo and with um, with passengers. It lands at 200 and um, 200 and 200 um, uh, tons. So you subtract the empty weight, which is 130, from the 200. You have 70 tons of cargo, 
and then if you look at when it takes off it takes off at around 250 tons so you subtract the landing weight from the um, takeoff weight um, you get around 50 tons of fuel so um, for this uh, for this aircraft and it cruises at Mach number of um, of 0.8 uh, Mach number so that's 900 kilometers per hour and that's the U infinity as we have seen before um, you you move on there's the engine we are interested in the thrust these generate a thrust around 300 350 um, kilonewton and then um, yeah so these are the these are the numbers that uh, we are uh, interested in looking at and then that will that um, they will um, they give us what the maximum fuel capacity of around 120 thousand liters so at a density of 0.8 you're getting around 100 tons um, 100 tons in fuel so you just fill up with um, with the amount that you want to travel with you don't want to overload your um, aircraft with fuel if you have a short trip and um, then you have to dump it so because you can't you're not supposed to land at um, higher than your maximum landing weight because the gears and as you land and the um, and the runway distance the stoppage distance um, will become affected so um, we went over through those dimensionless numbers that we will be seeing them and we will be seeing them often in this course I think the one that we haven't covered is the Mach number uh, which is uh, which um, has the speed of sound in it so it's a relation between the speed of sound and the travel uh, speed and here is where how you can compute the speed of sound for an ideal gas such as air uh, that's the specific heat ratios ideal gas so r is the gas constant and t is the kelvin temperature for for water if you're if you're interested in underwater so for hydrodynamics the speed of sound is about 1498 uh, meters per second it's much higher that gives you around 300 meter 300 350 meters per second um, so it's around five times four and a half times less than the speed of sound in water and one thing that we will be talking about next time is the moment coefficient so we will be computing moments so that's when you have a distributed pressure load over the wing just like we have seen in the delta wings before um, in this lecture um, they that that distributed pressure force will create uh, distributed pressure will create a force and that force will come with a moment depending on where uh, where your interest point is and that moment we we can report it as a dimensionless number which is the uh, moment coefficient and the rest we have covered uh, before so next time we will be talking about um, distributed pressure forces and um, as well as the center of pressure so we will stop here and thank you for your attention